and we are going to get our presentation up and running. Okay, so can everybody see that okay? All right, very good. Um, we're going to start and talk about, the first thing is why bother uh, with composting? And I think, again, uh, Derville has really sort of hit the nail on the head in terms of one of the uh, main points, again, why Antoshka has been involved in this is really sort of to produce our own compost or make compost from different biodegradable waste materials instead of mining our bogs for, quote, a compost product that really is not compost. And we're going to go over at the end, what is the difference between compost from peat bogs and compost that we make on our own or from the centralized facilities from our green, uh, bin, our, our brown bin programs. So one of the main reasons is we want to conserve our precious bogs and peatlands to protect biodiversity and the abundance of life they support. Uh, compost really helps to stimulate and feed the ecosystem of uh, life in the soil. And so it is stimulating biodiversity sometimes that we cannot see, but this supports uh, the plants that grow in the soil and therefore all the animals uh, and insects and all the other critters that depend on the plants uh, to, to, to live and thrive and as well as produce food that we can eat. Now I'll go up from the bottom up and might as well do it this way is that uh, by making our own compost, we can produce a wonderful soil amendment that can enhance the health structure and fertility of the soils around our home and in our community, in our schools, in, in, uh, in our parks, and uh, everywhere. There is soil uh, it needs uh, on our farms, uh, everywhere that we need uh, have soil, we can need compost to uh, enhance our, our, our soil. Um, we can also by um, diverting uh, green waste and food waste from landfill and to, from the incinerators, we can reduce the negative environmental impacts associated with these disposal methods. When we landfill biodegradable waste, uh, it generates methane, which is 300 times, or no, 30 times more potent than carbon dioxide. And when we burn waste, we can create nitrous oxides, which is 300 times more potent than carbon dioxide as a warming gas. So that's very important. We can save energy and cut greenhouse gases by saving all the number of trucks and, and, and refuge lorries that are coming around and picking up waste. Uh, and for us at home, we can reduce waste and save money on our bin bills. And we can save money on purchasing of, of, of soil amendment products and co quote compost from the DIY and the garden centers. Okay, so this is really the reasons or some of the reasons why composting is so important. But now I wanna sort of dive into sort of what we wanna go over tonight in the presentation and what the learning objectives for this evening are. Uh, first is to understand the biology and essentials of composting. And this is uh, relevant to both home scale, community scale, as well as large scale composting. It's fairly simple and I don't wanna make this complicated at all. We're going to describe the difference between a holding and a turning system for garden and landscape materials. We're going to understand the types of holding systems available and how to operate them. We got a lot of pictures. They're very simple single bins. We're going to look at the types of turning systems available and how to operate those. Um, and these are these are typically batch systems where we can run things through and create compost a little faster. We're going to describe what mulch is, how to make it, how to use it. We're going to understand how to set up and use a wormery, kind of a quick overview there. Uh, this is specifically a, 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 a lovely technique for converting food scraps into a very rich and lovely compost called Burmy cast. And then we're going to use, uh, understand how to use compost around your home. Okay, so that's what we're going to cover. And at the end, we're going to look at the difference between peat-based compost and the compost you make at home or uh, that come from the centralized compost facilities that are taking green waste and making compost out of it. Okay, here we go. So first to define composting and compost. Composting in its most simple form is the farming, okay? The farming of aerobic microbes promote the decay of biodegradable materials in a stable humus-like substance called compost. So let's break that down a little bit. Aerobic is in the presence of oxygen, Biodegradable materials were anything that was once living, okay? And so all we're doing is trying to create the right conditions for these aerobic mic microbes and organisms to, to thrive and to 
get them to consume uh, and decay biodegradable materials. And we're going to review a list of what those all are and what is good to compost at home. And the process results in this, this product called compost. Okay, so that's the most basic thing. We don't want to make it too difficult, but the process, it's a biological process, okay? And what we have is a food web of the compost pile, which consists of an ecosystem of life. And it's very similar to what lives in the soil. So in the lower right-hand corner, we have our organic residuals or biodegradable materials. And there's a group of organisms or many different organisms that are that, that consume or directly consume or eat the, the, the biodegradable materials. And these include bacteria, most importantly, molds and fungi, uh, actinomyces, seeds, different worms, different millipedes, uh, all these other things that will eat the materials directly. And then there's a second level of consumers that actually feed on the first level. So the, 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 the materials in the dark green are gonna then consume the, 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 the living critters that in the blue. And then there's a third level of consumers on the top, and it's the light green or olive green at the top that actually consume some of the, the organisms underneath. It's like the rabbits eat the grass and then the foxes eat the rabbits. So it's really an inter integrated ecosystem of life. Now, the important thing here in composting is that there's two things I want to say. Number one is that uh, there are, there's a succession of, of, of organisms that work in the compost pile. And at first, the bacteria are the ones that uh, um, feed on the organic materials first. So if we get the right diet and we give it air and water, and we'll go over this as our five essentials, uh, the bacteria take off and, and we'll get a nice hot pile and it'll degrade fairly quickly. But after that, then your, 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 your molds and fungi uh, your actinomyces and, and different other organisms will come in and, and, and they will play a role. For example, the fungi likes to like to feed on um, woody materials. And so they come in later in the process and help degrade some of the woody bits and the materials that are high in cellulose, like, like a, um, wood, wood shavings or straw or some of the stalky or the brushy materials that, that we have from our garden. And then of course, there's a, a number of worms and organisms and insects and centipedes and all these other things that also have, play a part in, in keeping this whole ecosystem healthy. And it, th I just wanted to show you all this because there are many organisms involved in the composting process. And if you see any of these, they're there for a reason. And in, in nature, we put food out for, for, for nature, something is gonna come eat it, all right? so. If we put, say, for example, meat out there, we're going to get fruit flies, not fruit flies, but we're going to get the 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 the, 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 the blue bottle flies, and they're going to lay eggs on that, and they're going to get you're going to get maggots. If we put out uh, chocolates and peanuts and meat and bones and stuff, you're going to get rats. If you put out fruit, you're going to get fruit flies. So if we basically put out the, a good mix of biodegradable materials and specifically um, garden and landscape material, we're going to then stimulate the bacteria, the molds and the fungi and all the other composting critters. And we're going to get them going to do their work to degrade and decay the materials. So given the biology, as I said earlier, what we're trying to do is farm these organisms. We're trying to sort of give them a balanced diet, just like we are raising cattle or, or, or pets or even children. You know, we have to give them a nice diet. We have to give them air and water and we have to give them uh, the right conditions to take off. So what I'm gonna be doing here is we're gonna go over these five essentials of composting, which is a good uh, balance of green and brown materials. It's uh, basically uh, small particles to provide more surface area because composting happens from the surface inward. We have to provide moisture because all life needs moisture to survive. We need air because we're trying to stimulate the aerobic bacteria and we need critical mass in terms of the type of composter. We need enough, enough materials and enough mass to stimulate uh, and, and, and uh, sustain the composting process. So I'm gonna now focus on these five essentials of composting. Okay, the first thing is the proper diet. All right, just like all um, life on earth, they, each, each, uh, all these organisms have a, 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 a diet that they need to survive and thrive. 
and the, and the bacteria that we're trying to stimulate need a good balance of green and brown materials. Now, green materials contain nitrogen that are, is essential for the creation of protein and microbe reproduction, while brown materials contain carbon, essential for providing energy to the microbes for growth. Think about it for us as meat and potatoes. The meat is the protein or the nitrogen, and the potatoes are the carbon, and it provides energy. And if we get a, a good balance of green and brown materials, the composting bacteria are going to be very happy, and they're going to take off, and they're going to uh, do their thing, and we're going to get a little hot pile. Okay? Now, let's look at the materials that uh, are appropriate for composting at home. And I've got the yes and no here to talk about in terms of what you can and shouldn't compost at home. First of all, most things that come from the garden are compostable. Grass cuttings, leaves, annual weeds, flowers, vegetable plants, old house plants, bush and tree trimmings, hay and straw, vegetative food scraps, so anything that comes from a plant, you know, fruit peels, vegetable peels, um, anything that, like for a flower and pasta and cereal and all this stuff that comes from plants. We can do rinse seaweed, removing the salt, of course, uh, cattle manure, uh, very good, good material for, for making compost. Vegetarian pet poop, so rabbit, gerbil, guinea pig, hamster, that kind of stuff is all good. Uh, shredded paper products in limited quantities, paper napkins and towels, again, in limited quantities, sawdust and wood shavings, pine needles and pine cones, all good for the compost. Now, what we don't want to put in the compost are diseased plants, because if we're doing a cool and slow process, the, the compost process may not kill off that disease and you may spread it back into the garden. And we also don't want to put in perennial weeds or noxious or what do they call them, invasive weeds as well. So we're looking at weeds that spread by root. And the four baddies in Ireland are ivy, brambles, or blackberry, or the... Uh, bindweed, the one that sort of winds up on the plants and have those beautiful white trumpety flowers, and also scutch grass. Now we can use the top of the scutch grass, but we don't want the roots that, that because they, it's all these things that spread by these big white roots. And of course, uh, as we know, the bindweed, once it gets in, it's kind of hard to eradicate. You need to dig it out, but we do not want to put them in the compost pile. Also weeds with seeds. Now the smart gardener always picks the weeds before they go to seed so you can compost them. But if we have weeds with seeds, they're gonna potentially survive the composting process, especially if we're doing a slow and, and, and continuous process, a slow and cool uh, composting process and the weeds may survive. And so when you spread your compost out, you're just gonna spread those seeds out into your garden. All right, no carnivore pet poop. So that's dog and cat poo, uh, cat litter. Uh, and no animal dry food scraps such as meat, bones, skins, eggshells, all the rest of that because it can uh, smell, it can attract uh, and, and, uh, uh, flies, and it also can attract our little furry friends, um, uh, four-legged furry friends. So we don't want to put those in, especially if we just dump things on the top of our compost pile. No dairy products, no grease or cooking oil, and no ashes from the barbecue fireplace or stove. Now, I'm always going to get a question about this, so I'm going to nip this in the bud at the moment. We specifically really never want to use coal ash because it contains heavy metals. But ashes from the barbecue fireplace and stove are good as a soil amendment, but I don't want to put them in the compost pile because it's going to raise the alkalinity uh, and, and, and upset the pH balance of the pile. And it's going to fill in the air holes in the pile, so it's going to suffocate the compost. If you've got a cup of it, fine, put it in. But if you got buckets, no. Well, let's save it and put it into the soil, especially if you have an acidic soil um, for when you're preparing your garden beds for planting. Okay, so that takes care of the no-nos. All right, here are some examples of the green materials, grass clippings, annual weeds, old flowers, vegetative food scraps, vegetarian pet poop right here. You can see that very innovative picture where somebody's got their rabbits right above their compost bins and the little critters just poop right in there. So that just saves a lot of work and voila. Uh, some of the brown materials are leaves, husks, paper, shredded, uh, shredded paper and pine needles. Anything that's generally brown in color is high in carbon, okay? And this helps to balance some of the green materials. 
Now, things that are well balanced are uh, autumn long clippings because they have both the grass and the leaves in it, any bush trimmings, bedded cattle manure, so bedded with hay or straw or bedded with uh, wood shavings uh, uh, is, is, is a good mix. Any bush or tree trimmings uh, or old vegetable plant or garden plants are all part and good and well balanced on their own. So all you need to do is chop them up, get them wet, and they're ready to go. Okay, so this chart here is very important. And what I like to show is that in the middle, we've got the, the, the compost sweet spot. And what this chart shows is from the left is things that are high in carbon to the right, which are things that are high in nitrogen. Okay, and in the middle, we've got that sweet spot of materials that are well balanced on their own. The, the bush or hedge trimmings, old plants, old flowers, um, anything, weeds from the garden, any plants from the garden, any veg plants, all those things are ready to go. Now, the issue really is when we want to compost food scraps or grass cuttings. And this is what has happened in Ireland 15 years ago when the local councils were passing out these compost bins. People would put them in their backyard and just dump in kitchen scraps. And all that would happen was that we got a stinky, gooey fly ranch. Okay, because it was not balanced. It was too wet and too green and it would get stinky. And it turned a lot of people off to composting. And the same thing with grass cuttings. Okay, if we try to gra uh, compost grass on its own, it's gonna get, either get dry and moldy or it's gonna get stinky and gooey. All right, so when we're trying to compost these two materials, we need to blend them with something to the left in the chart. Even in the summer, if we're gonna to try to compost grass cuttings, we can mix them with bush and hedge trimmings, okay? And with other things from the garden. If we're the smart gardener, we're gonna collect leaves from the fall, and then we have those ready to mix with the grass cuttings in the following spring or summer. And again, with animal manures, as long as they're bedded, or as long as it's um, bedded with hay, straw, or wood shavings, then it will compost nicely. But again, if we're gonna compost animal poo, we need to mix it with some brown materials, okay? So here you go. This is the crux of the matter in terms of green and brown, okay? All right, the next essential is surface area. And remember that actually compost bacteria work from the surface of materials inward. So they live on the surface and then they work inward to compost and break down the materials. So the smaller the particles, the faster they're gonna decay. It's like a block of ice in the sun. If you put it out whole and, and put it in the sun, it'll take a day or two to melt. But if you take a hammer and break it up into small pieces and spread it out on the ground, you could have that big block of ice melt in an hour or two, okay? And it's the same thing with the compost. Now we don't need to get fanatical. We don't need to cut things up super tiny. But what I'm saying is we at least wanna cut things up possibly with our secateurs into two, uh, four, six, eight inch pieces. What we don't want are pieces that are, um, you know, half a meter to a meter long. All right, so there's different ways we can do it. We can use a, a machete, we can use a shovel, we can use these little grinders. I like my secateurs. My secateurs are my favorite composting tool because as I garden, I am chopping things up and putting them into my little container, my, 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 my plastic little box, and then, um, I don't have to do it uh, before composting. And so a lot of times people will just gather materials like crazy uh, and then they pile it up in front of the compost pile and then all of a sudden you have all this stuff to cut up and nobody wants to do it. So I think it's kind of meditative when you're gardening. And I like to tell people that you're, you're, the composting starts when you garden. And as you pull weeds, as you uh, chop things, uh, especially in, in the autumn uh, or near autumn or late summer, and things need to be cut back uh, to cut things up as, as, you're, as you're gardening. So it, then the job of composting is much easier. We can also use lawnmowers to chop things up or shredders. Um, and so there are many ways to get things into the proper size. Now, the third essential really is moisture. Providing adequate moisture is really critical. And so what I like to suggest for people is to actually gather materials outside of your composter and to mix and water them, okay? Because any extra mo moisture and on, on fresh materials will actually drain off and move and, and just drain into the soil. 
But what we want to do is get materials to be wet as a wrung out sponge. It needs to be wet to the touch, okay? And so, and looking kind of sheeny, all right? So that basically you mix and water things, uh, let the extra moisture fall to the, into the soil, and then you just fork materials and put it into your composter. Now, again, it's important so that when you're about to add more materials to composter is to check the materials that are already in the pile or in your bin. And if they are dry, then please water them and mix a little bit to make sure, again, they have sufficient moisture. You want them soaking wet because if they get too wet, it's gonna create those anaerobic conditions. The water is gonna fill up the air holes and suffocate the pile. Again, wet to the touch and nice and sheeny. And that's what we want, uh, wet as a wrung out sponge. All right, okay. Now this is really probably the most important picture I'm gonna show you today, which shows you sort of composting at the particle level. You see three chunks of compost particles. And what we have is the film of moisture around each particle. This is where the bacteria live. And without this film of moisture, there is gonna be no place for the compost bacteria to live and therefore no composting will take place, all right? Now, if we put too much moisture in a the pile, then the air spaces between the particles fill up and we start to suffocate the pile, all right? So again, the, the moisture needs to be uh, uh, just a little bit, but not too much. It's like the three bears, you know, with the, with, with the porridge. Not too much, but not too little, okay? So this is what we want to try to achieve when we're starting to mix the materials and, and get them into our composter. Okay, aeration, number four, is, is important because what we want to do is maintain aerobic or oxygen-rich conditions. Now, if we're making a big batch of compost all at once, okay, what, what, what we'll get, and then we get the right material mix and got sufficient moisture, the pile is going to heat up. And as the heat rises, it will draw air into the pile and allow it to breathe. Now, we don't all make big piles at once, or we may not get sufficient materials to create this sort of compost reaction and get the heat. But what we can do is put, put something underneath to try to stimulate a little airflow so we can either uh, put the compost pile on some branches or on a pallet or on some wood like this, right? or we can turn the pile, okay? So this also introduces air into the pile. Now we don't necessarily need to turn the pile to make it happen, but it will speed up the process, okay? So again, we can, uh, when I explain the, the system with the holding systems, we can just put the materials in and just let them go and we'll make compost in a year's time. So it's all there. So how do you know when the compost is finished, folks? You use your senses. If it looks good, it's a, if it's a dark uniform color and you can no longer recognize the original materials that went inside, it looks ready. If it smells good, if it smells like uh, a soil or uh, uh, like the, the forest floor, it smells nice and earthy, then it's going to smell ready. If you've got a putrid or ammonia or sharp smell to it, it's not ready. If it feels good, all right, if it's friable in use and breaks up part and it gets crumbly, then it's all, all feels ready. So if it, when it looks good, it smells good and it feels good, the compost is ready to use. And it looks like the stuff that's in the picture here, okay? All right, so the summary of the essentials uh, are a mixture of carbon-rich and nitrogen-rich materials. And again, some materials will be well-balanced on their own, but if we're doing food, or grass, we want to mix them with other materials. We have sufficient moisture. We allow for passive or, or introduced air by turning to provide sufficient oxygen. If we give it time, we're going to make compost. Now, compost is a fairly forgiving process. If you have materials that are high in carbon, and we'll talk about this with leaf mold, it's just going to take longer. If we have a process that mainly has a lot of nitrogen-rich material or grass, or food, it could go through the gooey, stinky phase, but eventually it will turn into compost, especially with the help of our worm friends. Okay, so, um, but if it's dry, it's, it's just gonna stall and it's gonna, it's gonna stop. So the moisture is, is really a critical, uh, um, critical uh, essential that you need to pay attention to. All right, 
All right, so that's the um, that's the basic wrap up on the biology and the essentials, and they underpin all the things that we're going to do when we manage different compost systems. And what I like to do now is focus our attention on the four systems that can be used easily in Ireland to manage food scraps and or garden materials at home. And these include the compost holding bins, including leaf mold cages, compost turning systems, mulching, and we're gonna talk about wormeries because worms are nature's best composters. The holding systems, and here's the difference. The holding systems are a cool or cold, slow composting system that takes six to 24 months. Generally, anything I generate one year is gonna become compost for next year with these systems. It's a continuous system with little or no turning. We are adding materials as they're generated from the garden, okay? And then we're gonna harvest the materials, uh, the compost a year later. A compost turning systems are different. They work on a batch basis. And if you get the right material mix and give it sufficient moisture and air, you're gonna get a hot and fast composting process that takes a lot shorter time frame. You can make compost in as little as six to eight weeks, but generally I like to say 10 to 12 weeks to make a nice a cool down and stable compost. It's a batch system with regular turning. It's like baking a cake. You're gonna mix all the ingredients together, put it into the baking pan, stick it into the oven, let it cook, and out comes the finished product, the cake, or in this case, the compost. All right, so we're gonna go over these right now. The advantages and disadvantages of the holding units, and this is the simplest way of composting and what most of you will do because you have a smaller um, garden um, and it's the, the turning systems are more appropriate for larger properties. So schools, community gardens, large properties, farms, um, you name it. Uh, so uh, so the, the, this will be most appropriate for most folks in Ireland. It's the simplest method of composting and least labor intensive because we're just adding materials to the pile as it's generated. The bins are portable. They can move, uh, be moved where they're needed or you can place them in different areas of your garden or yard where this where the materials are they're flexible you can use one bin or two bins or three bins uh, uh, depending on how large your property is and how much a garden and green waste you're generating some of the units the plastic bins are good at excluding pests and retaining moisture but if they're placed in the sun they do dry out so it's very important we'll talk about where to put your compost bin in a moment uh, units with lids or covers prevent rain from soaking the pile. This is especially important in the winter months, okay, because you don't want the pile to get too wet. The disadvantages are they're slow, and it takes time to make the compost. If they're uncovered, they can get too wet in the winter, especially for compost that's more as older and, and, and act like acts like a sponge to soak up the moisture when it, when there's too much rain. The cooler temperatures, because you don't, you're not getting that whole big batch at once, may not fully destroy weed seeds and plant diseases. And so you, you'll, you'll produce sometimes a product that may contain the weed seeds, okay? Unless you keep them out. Again, uh, the big point there really is what goes in comes out. Rubbish in is rubbish out. If you control what goes in and you don't put the weed seeds in to begin with, then you're not going to get weed seeds coming out, all right? All right, so here's the simplest, just pile it up somewhere uh, and, and let it go for a couple of years. Again, here's, here's a pile of grass. And again, eventually it'll go through its slimy gooey phase and produce compost. But here's my favorite system right here, the pallet bin, because you can take a material that's normally thrown away and you can make a nice composter out of it by roping them together or using cable ties. So. It, this is a great system because it's easy to access. It's large. You can fit a lot of materials into it, um, and it's free. Holy moly, we got a free compost system here, folks. Um, we can also use panels of, of wire, coated wire. Uh, this can be in panels or it can be in a circular form, so just take some fencing. Um, there's some nice material out there uh, that's available for making leaf mold. I'll show you a picture of that in just a moment but we can use wire cages to make compo a compost bin. Um, here's an innovative system that was developed in Seattle with um, waste timber from a cedar plant. Uh, 
and using these metal rods and little holes in the slats and then you can kind of stack them every other and, and create some sort of uh, allows the air to come in to the compost bin. Here's a couple systems from Ireland here, a homemade system to the left. And this system made out of large from Irish timber products in County Meath, um, a lovely bin there uh, made of, of, of timber here in Ireland. Um, you can also make use do a homemade system made out of two by fours and, and hardware cloth with hinges and hook and eye so that the bin can be easily taken apart to either turn it or harvest the compost. Okay, so those are uh, different ideas. There's a variety of different plastic bins. Some are made from recycled plastic, some are not, but uh, again, these are very popular and available in various DIY and garden uh, centers around Ireland. Okay, and these are the bins that were mostly distributed by some of the county councils in Ireland. And here's one of the larger ones. Now the smaller skinny coney ones, I find I've had not much success with them because it's hard to get in and manage the materials. But this one's a nice big one. And so you put the materials in the top and voila, you can harvest the materials out of the bottom. Okay, so where should we place the compost bin? Knowing that we want to maintain moisture in the compost uh, bin, it is essential we keep it out of direct sunlight. So we need to put the bin in a shady or partially shady location on bare soil, which allows some of the soil organisms to come up like worms and some of the other organisms that are around um, and allows them to come in and help you with the composting process. I also like to say this, and I'll say this about the leaf mold bins, keep it away from ivy and brambles because they're just going to come in there and because it's so lovely, all that lovely, beautiful compost, keep it away from brambles and ivy and bindweed because they're just going to go in there and have a party. Okay, choose an area where you can easily add and get the compost out, all right? So make it easily accessible. Keep it away from the house or the neighbor's home just in case there are problems with odors, pests, and especially insects. Now, if you follow all of my guidance here, you're not gonna have those problems, really. Okay, so no worries about that. But it's the most important thing is to keep the bin in a shady location. All right, now here's the steps for success. Uh, for managing your holding bins. Once you set the, the bin up, you can add materials as they're generated. What I like to suggest, as I said before, when I was talking about moisture, is to, as you're gardening for the weekend, then place the materials in front of the bin. Okay, so maybe you're going to cut the grass, put the clippings down. Maybe you're going to trim the bushes, put the, put the bush trimmings on top. You're going to do some weeding. You're going to do all these other things, just basically, and you're going to chop the materials as you are generating them or as you're gardening so that you can put them into a, a pile in front of the bin. And then you can, then you can basically um, mix and water the materials, allow the moisture to drain from the materials and into the soil. And once that's done, then after you've mixed everything well together, then you can add them to the bin or your pile. And then the next time you garden, you just repeat these steps, but before you add the materials to the pile or the bin, check, check the materials that are in the system. Make sure there's adequate moisture. Maybe, maybe use your pitchfork or spading fork to just fluff it up a little bit, and give it a little air, and then put the materials on top, okay? All right, now, in terms of adding food scraps is we cannot compost food scraps on their own, as I said earlier. And it's important to actually start the composter with basically a third or more of garden and landscape materials first. So get the mix of garden and landscape materials first. And as you're gardening, again, put your stuff in front of the composter, mix in water, and just before you add them to the bin, bring your kitchen caddy out from, from the house, put it into the bin, okay? And mix it with the materials that are already in the composter, okay? This is very important. And then cover it with the fresh mixed garden materials that you have just generated and put it on top. The point is we always want to bury the food scraps within the composter. 
What we can't do is do a dump and run where we're gonna actually just open the top and hold our nose, uh, swat away the flies and put the food into the composter and pray for the best, okay? That's not gonna work. St. Patrick's not gonna help us with that, okay? So it's important to please do the, get make sure that the food scraps are buried within your composter, okay? All right, and in that way, it'll compost well, you have a good mix, it's gonna keep down any flies or odor, and you're not gonna attract any of our four-legged furry friends, okay? All right, that's it. Okay, now, as I said earlier, grass is very difficult to compost on its own. So there's two options here. One is actually just to cut the grass and leave it on the lawn. Wow, and it actually takes less time and less work to do this but we may have to cut the grass more often. So we let it grow four or five inches tall. We cut a inch or inch and a half off, okay? And we allow the grass to then clip the grass cuttings to actually just settle into the lawn. And as it breaks down, it will release nitrogen into the lawn and actually fertilize it. But if you need to collect the grass, and in a lot of cases, that's important because we got some people and the schools right now that I'm working in, uh, don't want the grass cuttings to attract into the school or the home. And so it's important to collect them. Fine. That's great. We can compost them. The grass cuttings make good compost. It's like adding gasoline to a fire. They're full of energy. They're lovely, but you've got to mix them with something else. So how do we do this? How do we compost the grass cuttings, right, in a way that we can make great compost? So here's what we do. We collect the leaves from the previous autumn in the leaf mold cage. So we have them available to mix with the grass cuttings in the subsequent spring or, or summer, okay? If you don't have leaves, then you can use straw, hay, weeds, uh, 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 bush or tree trimmings that are chopped up well. And you can mix and balance the grass cuttings to break it up and to give it, uh, give it some of that carbon that's needed for the composting organisms. So here we go, grass cuttings, get the leaves on there, mix it up, and then you can put it onto the pile uh, and, and, and away you go. Now, when we're using a plastic holding bin, again, if, especially if we keep it in a shady location, you can, as you, if you're good about mixing and chopping things up and not adding too much grass for food, you can get a uh, compost out of the bottom. Um, this is tricky. And I think they're, they may be sort of thinking that it may be a little easy that we just put the things in the top and we can just shovel the things out of the bottom. It sometimes isn't that easy, but it, it can happen, okay? But what I think is, is probably the, the best way to do this is that if you have taken six months or more to fill a bin, there's probably compost at the bottom. And so the easiest way I think to harvest this is to actually take the bin apart or in the case of the plastic bin is just to lift it up, okay? Because you can easily lift it up because of the shape. It's wider at the bottom and skinnier at the top. You can just lift it up and then you'll have a little cupcake that's left over. You see this one on the, the picture to the right, to the left, you see the, the compost pile is there. And what you can do at that point is fork off the fresh material on the top and put it into the bottom of the newly placed bin or, 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 or the plastic bin or, or your, in this case, your, your cage, okay? Until you get down to the finished compost. Now we went through that already. How do, can you tell when it's done? It looks good, it feels good, it smells good, okay? And then you can screen it or use it in any way, or use it as a mulch, or you can screen it and use it as a soil amendment or some of the things we'll talk about later, okay? And this way you also um, started the pile with some garden and landscape materials, and then you can easily mix your food scraps into them and then cover it again with landscape materials to make sure that you've got your uh, food buried in the compost, okay? So that's one way to handle it. Now, if it takes one to four months to fill the holding bin, then the compost is not likely to be ready. In this case, you might want to have another holding bin that you can start to fill while the first bin is, is maturing, 
Okay, so you, you'll have two bins. And this allows the, the bin that you filled first to, to, to fully compost and to finish, okay? So, all right. So this, these are the tips for, for faster composting using holding systems. Again, it's important to chop things up. It goes to our essential. We, we said the more surface area, the faster things are going to compost. So if we can uh, cut things up as we garden or put things through a mower or a shredder into smaller pieces, composting will happen faster. If we mix and moisten the materials before placing them into the bin, this will give you the proper moisture level. And I can't tell you how many schools that I've been to lately where the, the compost bin is placed into the sun and things dry out and people are wondering, why am I not getting a good compost? Because you don't have the moisture, all right? Again, another essential, all right? Good balanced diet, small particles, proper moisture, proper air, and you're gonna have every, all the critters are gonna be happy. All right, now, if the materials dry out, again, if your compost bin is in a partially shady or partially sunny location, just monitor the pile. And if it dries out, add moisture along the way, okay? And if you turn the pile, and this is something you can do, is that if you turn it once or twice in a season, it's gonna speed things up. Now, again, we don't have to turn the pile. If you just want to accumulate stuff and harvest it next year, fine, that's, that's no worries. But if you want it to go a little faster and, and harvest the compost a little quicker, then if you turn the pile, you're gonna get, uh, uh, you'll be able to mix things around, uh, add adequate moisture, or put the outside in so that the dry materials on the outside go into the inside. It just helps things go a little faster, okay? Okay. So a variation on the theme on the holding system is leaf mold. And again, this is the easiest way to compost, okay? It takes one to two years to make a lovely weed-free compost out of leaves from the autumn, all right? And I've got just a couple slides here to give you the tips for success in doing leaf mold. Now you can make these cages, you can use a pallet bin, you can just pile them in a pile and, and cover them if you want, just as long as they're wet. All right, so first is to pick a shady location. Be sure to keep the cages away from ivy, bindweed, or briars. As we can see right here, the briars have gone into the pile. Uh, one, you've got a nice little creepy cage in which they can crawl up onto, and two, they just love getting in there for all the nutrients and goodies that are inside. If we place the, the cage under a tree, place cardboard or weed barrier underneath to prevent the root, tree roots from growing up into it. Again, they're searching for those lovely nutrients, all right? And remember that small cages like the one pictured here can dry out in the summer, all right, so we want the cages to be at least 1.5 meters in diameter. Uh, two to three meters is ideal, and you can store 20, 30, 40, 50 bags of leaves in the cage, depending on the size. The, 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 the cages I put in for the schools are one and a half to two meters. We can get easily 30, 40 bags of leaves in them. If you've got a three meter cage, you can easily get 40, 50, 60 bags of leaves in them. Remember that the, the, the leaves need to be wet and I'm a lazy composter and a lazy gardener. So what I'm gonna do is collect the leaves when they're wet on the ground, either from dew or after rainfall, perfect. Pick them up then, put them in the cage and away you go. And put the cages where the leaves are, all right? So close to where they're being generated, okay? So this saves time and mixing and watering the leaves before adding them to the cage, all right? All right, now, the other thing is keep them open. They need the moisture. So let the rain rock and roll on them and, and keep it moist. Fill the cages in early autumn, allow them to settle. Top the cages up at the end of the leaf season. Don't overfill them because the top will dry out and then you just get the wind to blow them all around. So don't overfill them. Uh, so that, they, that they, you can keep it nice and tidy. Um, don't, now, the leaves will settle. After a year, the leaves will settle down. It'll be about half the size of the, the leaves that you initially put in there. Don't put the leaves from the following season into the cage because now you're going to have 
old leaves and new leaves, and it's going to be hard to harvest the compost out of it uh, the following year. Uh, monitor the moisture levels, okay, so um, make sure that in the dry summer, like we had a dry summer last year, uh, mix and water a little, mix and water them into the top layers as necessary so you keep it all wet. After one year, the leaf mold can be used as a mulch. After two years, you're going to get a lovely leaf mold compost as shown in the picture, okay? You can screen it and and return unde undecomposed leaves into new or existing cages, okay? But this is easy and it creates a beautiful compost um, that is weed free because there's no weeds, uh, seeds in the leaves, okay? All right, let's move on to the, uh, to the turning systems here, okay? Um, and these are characterized by the active turning of compost materials by either a bay system shown to the left a rotating barrel or a sphere, okay? So there's different kinds. The advantages, you can make compost quickly. Uh, the multi-bin systems hand handle a larger volume of materials and are ideal for larger properties or community composting systems in schools or at allotments. The high temperatures you get in the batch of making a big batch all at once will kill diseases and destroy weed seeds. The disadvantages are they're more expensive to make um, unless you make them out of pallets, for example, and we've done that in several um, uh, schools and different allotments. Uh, the multi-systems, bin systems can take up a little more space and they do require more time and labor to manage and turn materials, okay? But you get good compost quickly. Here we build a pile to the left. After a week or two, you can turn them to the middle. And then the third week, you just flip them over into the third bin and let it sit and cure. Um, we can layer materials, but it, this is just a way to proportion things, but you do, do need to mix and water things. Um, so again, paying attention to the essentials. Okay, another way to form a pile is to, to uh, mix and water materials in front of the system. And when they're well mixed and watered, you can add them to the bin uh, uh, or the system that you're using. Now, how, when do we turn the piles? Basically, the important thing is to, to monitor the temperatures. If you can do this by hand, or using a temperature probe. You can get one of these easy compost temperature probes at on Amazon for 15 euro, okay? So what happens is if we get the right mix of materials, the right moisture level, uh, the oxygen will be there for a while. But basically what we're talking about is, if you can visualize that, is a bunch of teenagers down in the basement. They're having a good disco party and they're gonna dance their hearts out until it gets a little too hot and stuffy and then they're gonna slow down because they're, they're suffocating. And it's the same thing with the compost. The compost gets all excited, the thermophilic bacteria take off, they go wild until they run out of either food or moisture or air. And in most cases with these big batch systems, they run out of air first. And then the temperature starts to decrease. And this is when you know to turn the pile. So when the temperature starts to go down and it will heat up to 50, 60, 70 degrees, as it starts to turn to go down, that's when you know how when to turn the pile. So here we go, we're gonna turn the outside in and inside out so we can kill all the, all the weed seeds, all the pathogens, all the fly larvae, all the rest of that stuff, okay? And that's the way you do it. Now, there are other systems available. We see this commercial unit to the right here in Ireland. We can use, uh, use pickle barrels or other different containers to, to make a, a, a turning barrel. We add everything at once into the system. We flip it around, we let it, let it cook, and then we can take it out, let it cure, and away we go. Um, here's a Cadillac system here with a very expensive, with a little um, on, a, on a stand with a hand crank. Um, with baffles inside. Um, here's a homemade system that we did in swords for a, uh, 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 an estate. And, and the guy did make it out of an old steel drum. He had baffles inside. And as you can tell, there's a little trap door. It drops down underneath the frame and then he stores it into that little holding unit to the right and allows us, all the materials to cure. And then after a few months, then it's ready to use, okay? This is a new kind of gimmicky plastic compost ball that you fill up and roll around the lawn. Okay, I had to show it to you just for, just for the crack, okay? There you go. But this is expensive 
and yeah, you know, try it. You might like it. Um, I, I think it's kind of gimmicky, as I said. Um, all right, so that takes care of the turning systems, and we're going to move to mulch. I know that we're 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 running along here, so we need to sort of cover some of these things fairly quickly. But mulch is anything that's applied to the surface of the soil, it, because a lot of the things that we um, generate from the garden may not compost well, especially woody materials. And so if we can chop them up um, or grind them up with a grinder or a shredder, then we can create the wood chips and we can put, put them on the surface of soil to protect the soil from erosion and compaction, conserve moisture, inhibit weed growth, and protect the plants from extreme weather. So they can be made from various materials. Okay, so we have here a picture of things that we can make mulch from, sticks, stalks, leaves, pine needles, paper, you name it. Okay, here's some of the little equipment. And again, um, some of the things, I mean, for me, it's like when I'm gardening and I've got big thick things, I just cut them up with my secateurs and put them in a bucket. And when I get enough in a bucket, I can then put mulch around an individual plant. And so you can do it that way. But basically we're gonna chop things up. Um, the machine to the, to the left is a little more efficient than the ones to the right. This is my favorite machine. Sometimes when I live in a house and I had a lot of stuff that was um, available uh, and I had to bring in a tree surgeon, which I did on a yearly basis, I'd ask them to actually chip things up and then dump his truck in my driveway so I could get a, a lot of mulch for my garden. Uh, and this is what you get. And it's lovely because we can place it around the perennials in our, in our garden. Uh, we can use it in a variety of different ways. So in, as a path material and the annual planting beds and perennial areas around individual trees, and we can use it as a winter cover and for erosion control. So let's take a little quick look at, at the different applications. Uh, the mulch can be used for pathways. I like to generally use a, either a weed barrier or I use cardboard underneath to keep the weeds down. I will put three to six inches of the mulch on top and replenish annually as needed uh, just to keep the weeds down. All right, there is, there's the good little example between the garden beds. Um, here's the big path with wood chip again, lovely there. Um, and, in, and basically the, the in annual uh, beds, we can use unscreened compost, okay, um, as a mulch around the annual flowers or vegetables, okay. And then uh, the next um, spring, when we're ready to plant, we can just dig that in and, and, and uh, amend the soil, put the plants in and then put another uh, layer of, of mulch of, of unscreened compost on top. So this is just sort of an annual way of doing that. Here we have a, in Cork, we did a little, um, it was a pollinator garden and we used compost to amend the soil before putting the plants in. We put wood chips around to keep the weeds down and to conserve the soil moisture. Okay, um, so in perennial areas, the smaller the plant, the thinner the, comp, the, the mulch application, spread evenly over the area, keep the mulch away from the plant stems. Uh, for uh, for those acid loving plants, we can use pine needles and leaves as a good mulch uh, because it's slightly acidic, uh, especially for blueberries and raspberries. And be aware that thick mulches are harmful to shallow rooted plants such as azaleas or rhododendrons. So just put one to two inches on there. Um, here we go, killed Canny Castle. If it's good for them on their rose beds, it's good for us. It's lovely. They have a lovely rich garden there and they're using mulch around their, their, their roses. Around trees, again, the, the roots go as far as the, the, the extent of the trees, that's called the trip line. Um, if we can actually uh, provide a little mulch around the trunk, then we allow nutrients and water to actually penetrate and feed the roots of the tree. If we allow that grass to grow into the tree trunk, then the grass is getting all the nutrients and water and the tree may suffer. So this is a good way to do that. Now, and I don't understand in Ireland that a lot of people who have allotments or gardens, actually when it comes time in October, uh, they just actually leave their garden beds and over winter, they just get filled with weeds. So in the spring, they've got to do a lot of weeding. And it, when you weed, you're going to remove a lot of the beautiful topsoil. So why not cover those garden beds with some kind of mulch 
And in this case, we're using hay um, or straw, straws without the, the weed seeds, we use a, a straw to cover the, the beds, or you can use leaves and cover them, or even cardboard. Cardboard also works good and just put stones on top, which will prevent the weed seeds from weeds from growing, right? And then all you do is remove them in the spring. You get a little compost underneath and dig it in and use it. Um, we can put mulch on, uh, on sloped areas to prevent uh, soil from eroding, okay? And so those are all the things for uh, the, the mulch. Now, um, just to sort of cover the last system, we're going to go into wormeries quickly. And again, what are the materials that are suitable for composting at home? And this applies to adding things to turning systems or to the holding bins or into the wormery. We want anything that comes from a plant is in, anything that comes from animals is out. This is what it looks like, okay? All right. So what we want to do is collect it in the kitchen. We want a lid on top to keep any source, especially in the summer months, that keep the fruit flies from landing in there and laying eggs, because then we're going to just move those eggs to the compost system. So put a lid on it, all right? And then we can feed it to the wormery. Now, worms are nature's best composters, okay? And the worms we're going to use here are not the earthworms. They're not the ones that live in the soil. The night crawlers, those are the nice thick gray worms. They like to eat soil. But there are red worms or tiger worms or banded worms that actually like to live in areas of high organic matter, like in manure piles, in the, in the top area of our lawn, in leaf piles, in compost, okay? This is what they look like. And there's my hand there with the worm and a couple of their eggs. They're cocoons that have little baby worms inside. They like a dark and moist environment because they breathe through their skin, all right? It's just like the mucus in our lungs. They have mucus around their bodies. The oxygen is absorbed into the mucus and then gives the worm plenty of oxygen to survive, okay? Now, I like the box to the left. It's a little more easier to manage. The little stackable systems do work, but they're a little more fussy and they've got an open top and it can get a little too wet. In both cases, you need to make sure you have adequate bedding. And what I like to do is bed the wormery with a mixture of leaves and paper. The leaves have a lot of nutrients. The paper hold moisture, which is important to keep that mucous membrane all healthy around the worm's body and gives them food. They like to eat the leaves. So if you don't give them enough food, they'll eat the bedding. Okay, we're gonna shred up the paper. We're gonna mix it all together. We're gonna add it to the wormery. And then what we want to do, in, like in all cases when we deal with food, is we have to bury it. Bury it in the compost bin, bury it in the soil, bury it into the wormery, okay? Because if we leave it on top, we're going to get flies, okay? So we can do it either in little, little sections. Uh, I like to do it on a weekly basis where I dig a trench, I put the food in, I mix it with the bedding underneath, and then I cover it with the little materials that I took out. I use the little papers to gauge the moisture. If the papers stay wet, we know the bedding's wet enough. If it dries out, we can then know that the bedding's too dry and we take our watering can and we give it a little bit of water. Now, if anybody wants a little instruction on the how to set up an operated wormery, let Durville know and I'll send you a guide for how to do the wormery, okay? It's very easy. And there's a DIY here in the Dublin area that actually will cut the timber to size. And all you need to do is just uh, drill it together with a little drill and make your box. Okay, there's the papers. This serves as a little moisture meter as well as creates a barrier for flies to tell you if the bedding is wet enough. Okay, so that covers the four systems for managing garden and landscape materials. And so what I wanted to go over quickly right now is what system should I use? And it really depends on what materials you have. So if you've got a lot of woody material, mulching is going to be the way to go. So chip it up, use the mulch, and it does uh, put a nice layer there to keep the soil moist and keep the weeds down. What I found about using all the mulch, mulch in my garden was that it created a, a, a habitat for birds because they love to scratch around there to get all the little critters that were there, the bugs, the insects, the worms, and all the rest of that stuff that were in there. So it really was stimulating biodiversity. 
If we've got a lot of grass cuttings, I recommend grass cycling so you don't have to deal with it. Cut the grass and leave it on the lawn. The golf courses, the local authorities, the parks, they're all doing this. It's the best management practice for grass cuttings. If we've got a lot of leaves, we can create and create a leaf mold cage and make leaf mold. If we've got a mix of materials, then we can do a compost system. And remember that we can always use a combination of systems. I know that to some folks have a compost bin and a leaf mold. Some people have a little compost bin and a wormery. So there's different things to be done and you can have a combination. The, if you're gonna choose between a holding system and tur turning system, it really depends on the volume of materials you have. If you have lots, you might do a turning system or a, a few of the holding systems. If you have a little bit to a moderate amount of waste, you might wanna just do one holding bin. Uh, it also depends on the space you have and how fast you wanna make the compost and the quality of the compost and how you'd like to use it. So if you want a nice weed-free, pathogen-free compost, then you're gonna do a, a turning system to get a, a hot compost. Okay, how can we use compost? This is the, we're, this is the last session section here. So we're gonna wrap it up in five minutes here. Sorry about going a little over here, folks, but I hope everybody is enjoying their popcorn and biscuits um, while we're giving you the rundown on how to use your compost. It can be used in five ways, as a mulch, a soil amendment, an ingredient in a potting soil, an ingredient in a seed starting mix, or as a way to make compost tea. As a mulch, again, we're placing the material on top of the soil um, and it helps to protect roots. And, and as, it, as it rains or we irrigate or water our garden, it, 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 it releases nutrients that soak down into the root zone of the plants and the plants can easily soak up those goodies. It conserves soil moisture because you've got the, 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 the mulch on top. It smothers and inhibits weeds, prevents erosion, and eventually builds soil quality uh, because the worms in the soil will come up and grab that organic material and bring it down into the soil. Okay, and as I showed to you earlier, is that you put the mulch on at one uh, uh, for one season, and then the next season before planting, you can just dig that old mulch in and use it as a soil amendment. Okay, this is what it looks like here. Put a couple inches down around your, your annuals, okay? The plants just love it, okay? They just absolutely go crazy because you're giving them nice food. All right, there we go. All right, we can put it around in perennial areas and around trees, okay? Here's uh, the, the compost using in both an annual and perennial area, again, keeping the weeds down, all right? So that is all handy dandy. The next thing is using compost as a soil amendment. This is where we get the compost into the soil. Okay, so you put two to four inches into on top and dig it in. It provides essential nutrients and minerals. And the good thing is that compost uh, basically um, has both macronutrients, the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, as well as all the micronutrients like iron, magnesium, zinc, calcium, boron, all the rest of it to keep the plants healthy which the chemical fertilizers do not have, okay? We supply organic, valuable organic matter that improves soil structure, okay? And uh, improves our soil drainage uh, in sandy soils. It helps us have moisture and nutrient holding capacity in the root zone of the plants. We prevent soil compaction and erosion. It buffers soil acidity, okay? So if your soil is, is slightly acidic, uh, and you put the compost in, it's gonna make it more neutral and allows the nutrients to move into the root zone of the plant. Um, it increases crop uh, yields. Again, you're gonna get more flowers, more veg, more fruit, and it suppresses plant disease. It's magical. It's an elixir. It's a lovely stuff. And especially the worm compost, it's got a plant hormone on it that actually really stimulates plant growth. I like to say that the worm compost is a aphrodisiac for plants, and it is. They go absolutely wild. So here you go. What we know about soil science is that the compost feeds the, the ecosystem of life in the soil. And as they break the compost down, they release vital nutrients to the plant roots Right, and here the picture is showing here a, a, a tip of a, of, a, of a root hair and the, the bacteria in the soil are actually then supplying nitrogen to the, that the plant can absorb. The little critter to the right is a 
fungus that actually is sucking sugar out of the plant root in exchange for phosphorus and potassium. Okay, so there's all these symbiotic relationships that are helping the plants get the nutrients they need to be healthy, okay, and to fight off disease and to grow beautiful flowers and beautiful veg and all the rest of that. So this is very important. Okay, here's what it looks like. We're going to put, put two to three inches of compost onto our garden beds. We're going to dig it in. We can use a rototiller. Um, here's uh, at my place in Seattle many, many years ago, putting compost on, spreading it out, using a, a tiller to, to get it into the soil, add the seed, break it in, water it, and boy, I had a lawn that lasts me 10 years without adding any chemicals. It was absolutely fantastic. If we use the compost in the soil below, before we put on a sod, it holds the moisture to the top and allows the roots from the sod to easily penetrate and establish itself. You get a, a better take up uh, of the sod. If we're planting trees or bushes, we can use the compost to mend the soil in the hole, put the compost in, mix it with the soil, mix the compost with the soil that you took out and then put it back around the plant and the plant's gonna love you. And this is what happens. It's beautiful. The compost, the plants go crazy. They absolutely love it. And you're feeding the soil. So the bottom line here is that healthy soil grows healthy plants, okay? And that's the thing. Any good organic gardener knows that if we create healthy soil, we're gonna be a successful gardener, okay? All right, now quickly here about uh, the three other uses of compost. We can sieve the compost and we can either make a potting mix or a seed starting mix. So on a, on a, on a potting mix, we're gonna take one third sieved compost and we're gonna mix it with two thirds garden soil and we're gonna create lovely, lovely potting mix. This picture to the right is in Limerick at the Parks Department. Look at those beautiful flowers. In Limerick, also to the upper left, we're seeing them using compost with half compost, half sand to make a nice seed starting mix, okay, to get your garden started early. And of course, leave it to the Brits, come up with compost tea. Now you can make tea out of manure, nettles, comfrey, among other things, or you can use compost. You're going to put the compost into a mesh bag, burlap, or you have these plastic mesh bags. You let it sit in the water for two or three days, and you can take the water out and irrigate the plants. And it gives you nice nutrients and lots of goodies to help the plants suppress plant diseases. Okay. All right. Lastly, I just wanted to talk about the difference between peat moss, which they call compost. It is not compost and real compost that we can make at home. And far as nutrients, the peat moss does not contain any essential plant nutrients. Because the peat moss is in a bog, it takes centuries for the peat moss to be created. It is an environment where you have water running through the bog and rinsing out all the nutrients. So there's no nutrients. There's a lot of organic matter, but there's no nutrients. Compost not only contains one to two percent nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, but it also has an abundance of micronutrients essential for healthy plant growth and disease suppression. So it's loaded with the goodies. As far as peat moss goes in terms of acidity and alkalinity, the peat is acidic. If we add the peat to the soil, it's going to inhibit nutrient transfer to the soil for plant roots. So it actually doesn't do any good there. It actually makes things worse. Compost is pH neutral, which improves plant availability within the soil. Now, in terms of biology goes, peat is dead or lifeless. There's no life in it. Where compost is full of a vibrant community of life. It has all the bacteria and all these wonderful soil or uh, soil microorganisms. Um, and it, it helps feed the soil or re-inoculate dead soil. Okay, and so you can actually add life to your soil if it's been abused over time. Now, in terms of carbon to nitrogen ratio, the, the peat is very high in carbon. So when it breaks down in the soil, it's going to require nitrogen to break it down, and it's going to compete with the plants you have. And what we this is what we call robbing nitrogen from the soil. 
So this requires then, if you use peat, you're gonna to have to use chemicals to supplement and provide that nitrogen that's needed for plant growth. Now, compost on the other hand is low in carbon and has nitrogen. And so as the, the community of life in your soil breaks down the compost, it will release nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium. For, so for the plants to easily uptake it and it helps stimulate plant growth. Now in moisture holding capacity, yeah, the peat is better than compost, but they both hold moisture in the soil. So peat is just a, a, a more efficient at that because it is it's, it's just dry, little dry little bits. Uh, but in terms of particle size, the peat is very fine. And so if you're putting it into a dense clay environment, it's gonna, you're still gonna have a dense, uh, uh, um, a, a dense soil. Uh, the compost has variable particle size, which helps open up the soil for better drainage, better aeration, uh, and, a, and a more healthy uh, soil structure. So these are the essential differences, and it's important to understand the difference between peat moss and compost, because compost is far superior as a soil amendment, as a growing media, as a way of stimulating the plant growth, because it feeds the ecosystem of life in your soil, okay? All right, so um, troubleshooting, I think I'm gonna go over this very quickly because we're running out of time here. And I think really when you're troubleshooting your composting system, you need to ask yourself the following questions. What sort of system are you using? What, what type of materials were made to use the pile? If you had all grass, you know what the problem is. If you use all leaves, it's gonna take time. If you have all food, yes, it's gonna get stinky and gooey. All right, how old is it? I mean, it might look at the top that there's the undecomposed stuff, but there could be compost underneath. Is the pile wet or dry? If it's too wet, it's going to get stinky and anaerobic. If it's too dry, it's not going to compost. What does it look like? Poke around. It could be, as I said, there could be uh, dry stuff on top and underneath. There could be a lot of goodies under there. All right, so you need to poke around inside and turn it. Does it smell bad? Are there flies or rats? These are all things that can help you then solve the problems. And so I'm not gonna go over this chart and I think what the, the slide presentation will be available to you. Uh, I'd like to leave enough time for questions. So we'll end it at that and I appreciate your attention. So thank you very much for, 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 for being with us tonight. So Derville, why don't you uh, take it away here and sure. let's see if we can do a little Q and A here. Great, and thank you so much, um, Craig. I, I always feel after you do this that it's like a marathon. <laughs> it's it not stop for an hour, so fair play for so for such a motivating and comprehensive workshop. I think not only is it great in terms of the how to and the detail, you really sell it as an alternative. I think to the the commercial peat moss, and it, and that's a real reason why Antashka is promoting this. Like I said at the start. So I hope we have lots of converts here. I'm sure most of you came here interested in composting, but hopefully this has really sold it for you. And so we have a couple of questions we can get to now. Um, so Sue asks, what about the contents of vacuum cleaners? Okay. Interesting question. Sue. So, Sue, that's a great question. Vacuum cleaner bags, it really depends on what you have in your home. If you have a home that has wool carpet, or cotton carpet or linen carpet, then yes, you can add the contents of your vacuum bag into your compost pile. If you've got a synthetic carpet, in which we most of us do have that, then it's a no-no, okay? So we wanna keep it out of the compost bin. So if you've got natural fibers um, in terms of the, 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 the carpet in your house, yes, if you've got wall-to-wall -wall carpeting or synthetic carpet, it's a no, no, no. Is that okay? Because we don't want all those microplastics in the compost, which then will get into the garden because it won't break down. Makes sense. Does that, I hope that answers the question, Sue. Um, and next we have Avril. What about the dye from shredded paper? So I presume if there's colored paper. Okay, so generally, I don't like to add paper to the compost pile, especially with garden and landscape materials, because when it gets wet, it just mats. I prefer to use leaves and other sources of carbon, like straw or bush trimmings or wood shavings. So I like to stay away from paper. But we do use paper in wormeries. And I want you to know 
that back in the day, and I would say 40, 50 years ago, you had uh, inks with heavy metals. Uh, now, they actually design the paper for babies to eat because, you know, a lot of times the babies will eat the comics and all that kind of stuff. So the inks from the paper are generally A-OK. -okay. So dyed paper should be just fine. Great. Okay. So Claire asks, uh, what do you think of hot composting booms? I think you, you kind of covered that in the holding ones, but... Well, I think there is something called a hot compost bin. It's one of those rotating bins with a lot of um, insulation in it. And yeah, they do work. They are expensive, but they do work. And all you need to do with the hot compost bins is pay attention to the essentials. You can't just put food in there. You're going to need some pellets or some wood chips or wood shavings to get you that balance of materials, and then you'll be successful. The second thing with a hot bin is that you can do a batch, but eventually you're going to need to take the, the material out, put it into a pile or into a bin and let it sit so it can cure. But the hot bin is a good way to get things started. So they, they do work. Um, right. Craig, it's, it's one that doesn't rotate. You know, it's just insulated. It's almost like thick aero board or something like that. And it's got the temperature thing on the top. Okay. Um, right. So again, these and I and my colleague actually down in County Cork has one of these and he's been working and experimenting with it. And again, the important thing with all these systems is to pay attention to the essentials. Make sure that you have a good balance of materials, okay, and adequate moisture. Make sure that you put the bin in a shady location so it doesn't get too hot in the sun. All right. And if you follow the essentials, the bin will work well, all right? And it, it is, they are, these are designed to work well. They do have the monitoring systems. They do provide the insulation, which helps to stimulate the, 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 the mesophilic and the thermophilic bacteria, which are the hot bacteria, and, it, and they do work. But again, got to chop things up. You got to get the good mix and you got to maintain a proper moisture level and you'll be just uh, fine, okay? Uh, Claire, Thank you. is that okay? Thank you. Yeah. Great. Um, so William had a question, and I can't, you might have covered it a little bit. What is the best size pile to use? Okay, so uh, optimally, you want a pile that's at least one cubic meter in size. Okay, now when you have a hot bin that's insulated, then you can get away with a little smaller system. But um, I like to get at least a cubic meter in size, and that's why I like the pallet bins, because it gives you a nice critical mass. Uh, to help insulate it, it's self insulating, and and you have a, a good ability to hold moisture. So um, I've also created systems where you've got a two two square meters. Uh, it's two meters by two meters, so it's it's basically and uh, about a meter. So it's it's four square meters in size. And if you have one square meter up, it's four cubic meters. Those also work well. But uh, at least uh, a, a cubic meter, I think, is, is, is a good size to start with. Thank you. Thank you, William. Great. And um, Karen, next, do you need to put holes in the bin? So aeration question. Uh, the holes are, it depends on the kind of bin it is. I mean, the, the plastic bins I have found, uh, sometimes it, they hold moisture too well, especially if they're in the shade. And I've seen these skinny coney systems that are and people put just food in them and all they are is, a, they, all you get is a sludge out of them. So holes would help in that instance. But again, uh, the, the advantage of having those type sort of systems is they are more rodent proof, okay? And again, we need to follow our essentials. If we have a good mix of materials, um, then the, 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 the pile should breathe a little bit, but I think holes or slats or all this other stuff helps passive aeration, okay? But then, of course, we have to then watch and make sure that the piles don't dry out too much. So we wanna always monitor moisture. Everything's a trade-off in composting between moisture and air, or between the size of the composter and sort of what it's made out of. Mm. And so, um, the, you know, one solution may be good for one type of system and another uh, is for another type of system. But yes, I think having holes or, or putting materials underneath to lift it up and get a little air through the system is always good. So, uh, uh, so I hope that answers your question. 
And um, Avril, next, what you, can you do if your compost turns anaerobic? If you've forgotten to add enough brown materials, can you mix this compost with better compost? Okay, Avril. Um, I had this situation in a school I worked with. They had these skinny towers and we tried to first, um, we took, we lifted the, the, the bin up, we put it next to the big cupcake. We then mixed leaves in and put it back into the composter and that didn't work. It was just too wet and it didn't get enough air. So what I decided to do was to make a big um, leaf cage. Okay, so it was nice and big and had the air all around it. And we took the, all that material out of the, these anaerobic piles and we added more leaves and we mixed it thoroughly and we put it into the leaf cage, which is more open to the environment and allowed air into it. And so this did sort it out. It was um, after trying to um, use the, the bad system to make it better, it didn't work. We had to actually go to a different system. So that's why I like the pallet composters or the ones that are a little larger or the big cages with the more robust fencing that then allows good airflow into because the air will naturally go in a foot or two on its own from the sides. And so if you have something that's open and not so enclosed, then it'll, it'll actually turn the pile around because what you need to do is to turn those anaerobes and actually when you put them a lot of air in there, they sort of die off and the aerobes take over and they will do that easily because there's food there for them. And as long as you have a good mixture, and again, we, we added a lot of leaves to this pile to get it sort of drier and to give it some air space in the pile. And then it turned it around so that after we did that, within two weeks, we went down with our little screw aerators. They're like corkscrews and you can put them down and then lift the pile up. Um, we had a, a more pleasant smell because this, this, these piles were manky. They were absolutely manky smelling. And uh, uh, we were able to turn it around. So yes, you can turn it around there. You just get a good mix. And, and, and if, especially if you're composting a plastic bin, try something that's more open. Great, thank you. Um, so Angela, are compost accelerators yep. useful? Oh, so I love that. Buy in the box and sprinkle it on. Yeah, okay, so let's go back to Avril's question on the instruction for the wormery. I'll get those to Duraville and we'll get that out to people. Right. Yep. Okay, yes, and that, that, and that is the wormeries do work really well and they're not that difficult and I'll, I'll help anybody who wants to get started with that. So uh, Avril, we're gonna help you get going. Uh, the accelerators, okay. Um, can I say this? Is there probably what we would call in America snake oil? All right, um, all the bacteria you, you need for composting are on the materials. And all we're doing is creating the right conditions for them to take off. So if we're good farmers, we give them the right diet, and we give them air and moisture, the composting bacteria will take off and accelerate and they'll do their thing. A lot of times you're gonna see, there's two things I wanna tell you on this, which is really pretty funny. Number one, is that you have leaf compost uh, accelerator. And all that is is a little box of fertilizer they're gonna charge you five or 10 euro for. So all they're doing is giving you a source of nitrogen to help speed up the composting of your leaves. Now, I also was in, um, working with a nonprofit organization and building compost piles every, every week. And this guy came up to me and he said, I've got the compost accelerator that you need for your composting operation here. And I said, well, where did it come from? He said, I got this accelerator from the peat bog. And I said to him, oh my God, can you believe it? That peat bogs are actually anaerobic. So you're gonna give me a compost inoculator with anaerobic bacteria. <laughs> and I thought, oh my God, how stupid can you be? But it is, there's, there are a lot, there's lots of stuff out there that you don't need. Now, the only accelerator that is works for the system is the green cone. Now, the green cone actually gives you a powder that's mostly enzymes, which help break up 
and break down the cell walls to release water. Okay, now that's the only accelerator that I'd recommend is if you've got a green cone system that they have this little powder that goes with it, but it's enzymes that actually help break things down a little quicker. Just like the enzymes that are in your gut, okay, that they help to sort of break up the food and help you digest the food. And that's the only powder that I'm going to say that it actually works for the system it's designed for. I hope that answers your question. Now we've got a couple other good ones yeah. here. I think we've got three there, I think, that are quite similar. Um, we've got one that we had last time, which is amazing. Is urine good or bad for the compost pile? Um, pet hair after grooming okay. and then animal waste in general. So kind of. Okay, you know, uh, guys, I love you guys. These are good questions. Um, okay, so number one is pet hair. Pet hair is compostable, okay? Um, it's fairly... Um, resistant to rot, but if you mix it uh, up good and you have a good compost process, it will eventually break down. So you can add it uh, just as long as you're not running a kennel and most of the stuff in your compost pile is pet hair. Uh, you need a good active compost system and then you can add a little bit. If you have one dog or a cat and, or, and you're brushing them and you wanna add the hair to your pile, a big pile, it's not gonna be a problem. Okay, urine, all right. Urine is high in nitrogen. So if you've got a leaf mold pile, go pee away. God, go on because the leaf need the leaf pile needs nitrogen. Uh, it's sterile, so it's not gonna it's not gonna create any kind of pathogen or other problems. You know, wee wee is is sterile, so it is good. Just don't pee on a big wet pile. Okay, you want uh, to use it as a way to moisten the pile. So maybe even just take the wee-wee in the watering can that you use to moisten materials before adding it to the pile, it'll help. So that's no problem. Um, and then the other question was, um, sorry. Animal waste. Animal, PP, and then animal waste, okay. No carnivore animal waste. So no dog do, no cat poo. Especially cat poo has a, a, a pathogen that could affect pregnant women. So definitely don't want to use that. Um, any kind of carnivore pet poo could have diseases that could actually transmit to people. Um, my suggestion with pet poo, especially dog do, is flush it down the toilet. Okay, that's a really good way to get rid of it. Because uh, the, the sewage system is handling our poo and pet dog poo is very similar because it's a carnivore. Okay. Um, also, if you have a dedicated green cone, that can be a good way to deal with dog do. Um, again, putting it in a uh, non productive, non food area of your garden. Okay. So that's another way to deal with the dog do. Cat, cat do and cat litter probably will go into the black bin. So there's really no, no unless you're scooping uh, the cat poopy out of the, out of, and which I used to do. My mom had three cats, so I was on the cat litter duty. Um, you can scoop it up. If you just shake the litter out, you can actually flush it down the toilet and then make the cat litter last a little longer. So that is uh, pet poo. Any kind of vegetarian pets, uh, hamsters, rabbits, gerbils, um, you name it, that's good to go in the compost pile. So no worry. Chickens, you know, again, um, sheep, uh, cows, horses, all that's good for composting. Makes lovely compost. So work away with all the vegetarians. Uh, that, that's a good ingredient for the composter. Great. I th well, that's the, all of the questions. Um there uh, so I think we have covered everything and, and thank you so much Craig for for being so detailed and comprehensive in your answers because I think it's very reassuring for people you know to to get those questions answered um and I really appreciate everyone joining us here tonight I know the, the weather's getting better in May and the nights are longer so sometimes you don't want to sit at a laptop so we really appreciate you coming today um and I suppose from us and Antashka please you're very welcome to join us and to become a member of Antashka, please do. And I'd really, I suppose, hope that you would share and pass on this composting journey with other people, tell your friends and family. If you find yourself in a garden center, do ask them if they're stuck in peat moss and tell them why it's not a good idea. And if they, if they have alternatives, so peat-free compost, it's really important that we stop uh, the sale of peat moss um, in commercial horticulture gardening. It's, 
it's it's really has to end the extraction is causing our bogs total destruction in the habitat but also their amazing carbon sinks and obviously during climate um, emergency that's really important so please pass the word on and you can get our composting guide www.antashka.org slash compost i'll get all the resources from craig and we'll make sure to send them on to all the attendees this is being recorded so we'll also pass that on so absolutely spread the word spread the enthusiasm craig is infectious so i hope that uh, you do do fly the flag of composting thank you so much thank craig. you everybody yeah, no worries. Thank you, everybody. You got the condensed version of our sort of our master composter training. So uh, the booklet does reinforce everything that we discussed tonight. It is a probably the best booklet on composting out there. Uh, thanks to Antashka and all the people that helped me with writing this, including Nula Madigan with the Irish Peatlands Conservation Council and some of my other colleagues. So I want to give a, a sort of a... a, a of notice out to all those folks. But thank you for caring, everybody. Thank you for coming. Thanks you for being uh, compo uh, getting into compost. I, I know it's going to help you with all your gardening. God bless you all.